All right, we're gonna just kind of kind of do a round robin here a little bit around when we ask the questions. So I'll kind of keep going down the line or pick different ones. So one of the first things I want to start off with are what are some of the ways? Why are those people sitting so far away? <laughs> Come sit up close. Come over. <laughs> uh, what are some of the ways that ethical dilemmas play out in the infosec field? As a CISO or a, C a security professional, maybe something that you can share from that you've seen in your past around how ethical dilemmas play out in the infosec field. Michael, do you want to start? What? Can, can, you, can you hear me? Ethical, I, I, ethical dilemmas. Ethical dilemmas. Ethical dilemmas, Mike. Uh, Tell us about your ethical dilemmas. Uh, well, I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a shirt called his, Truth Inside. His ethical dilemmas? <laughs> no, not yet. He has seen. What do you I, see? I've seen ethical dilemmas. Yeah. I, you know, I I've seen a lot of uh, vendors taking advantage of uh, customers in in how they put their proposals together, what kind of conversations they talk about. I see kind of ethical dilemmas in um, compliance related, uh, uh, reporting, breach reporting, those, those all over, it's kind of all over the place. But the biggest one is around vendors and, part, uh, and customers and proposals, conversations, um, actually doing what they say they do. Megan, do you have any comments? Oh, we have a sound issue. Is it off? How about you just say it and I'll repeat it. You repeat it? In your voice. Um, well, I like, um, what, well, I like what Michael brings up. About. About. Uh, uh, vendors and sales practices in security. That was a lot. You said a lot right there. Smart stuff. We need more She says really smart stuff. We need more transparency. It's, it stinks too because she says Between their sales department and their InfoSec engineer department, there's a lot of transparency that can take place between engineering and the sales team. Did I capture it pretty good? That sounds pretty good. All right. Brad? Yeah. Good stuff. You know, one of the other things that we see, not just in that, but in the day-to-day -day workings, you know, I, I remember um, working at a place where a longtime employee who's a friend of the owner, web filtering caught him at going to very inappropriate adult sites during the day, right? How do you handle that, right? You gotta, it's a very sensitive subject. So you got to understand, you know, what's the right way to, to go to the, you know, grandmotherly HR person and, and explain what's going on. It's not, not a great deal of fun. I am an ethical dilemma. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it takes like a second for the mic right. to kick yeah, in. The ethical it's dilemma cool. stuff. Um, I think there's there's a lot of ethical dilemmas, and there's a lot of just people doing things without even knowing why they're doing things. I think there's a lot of herd mentality. Uh, so I don't know if they purposely kind of buy things that they don't need, they don't that don't work that. They don't know how to use, but they're not willing to use, or, you know, so I don't know if it's necessarily an ethical dilemma. It does, I always call, like you have the attackers, right? The ones that we all think of, the ones that are doing the ransomware attacks mm -hmm. and all that stuff that obviously they're unethical, but then you have the wolves in sheep's clothing too, the people within our industry who aren't, who aren't serving well. And it's not just vendors. We have a lot of practitioners, I think, in our industry who, for lots of different reasons, that are probably causing more harm than good. So I don't know if you call that ethical or unethical. It's still a young industry, and hopefully we're kind of figuring ourselves out a little bit. I'm going to toss this out there. Have you ever seen where when you're doing any type of incident response or working with a client, and the client is asking you not to disclose something, and how do you respond to something like that? I mean, don't give the real world, but like hypothetically, you know, because there are some institutions that would rather not have their executive team know how dirty their laundry is. And so what does that look like? What is it? How do you guys handle that as security professionals when you're consulting or you are there trying to help them? Well, the, the consulting, for me, it, it doesn't last long. I won't be working there for very long. 
and uh, and this has happened you know numerous times. One time in particular was a uh, a medical company, a healthcare company, and we did their assessment and it was really bad. And so we worked on a roadmap and they were going to execute on the roadmap. And then we came to do the assessment the next year and it was another analyst. And the assessment was still really bad. And they're like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, obviously they're not taking it seriously. So I asked them to set up a meeting and we went and had a meeting and I asked for as many high level C's as we can get. And uh, I remember what I said was, you know, this is what this score means, right? It's really bad. And you need to go through this risk, uh, you know, exercise. Do I accept, mitigate, transfer, avoid? And they're like, well, what if we just accept it? And I said, and that's the bullshit. Because this isn't your information. This information belongs to the people that come through that door for their treatment. So if we want to take that score, let's go ask some people that come in through that door if they're going to be okay with that score. And I think that's finally when it kind of hit home for those guys. But I think you have to use different techniques for different situations. But at the end of the day, you can only hit your head against the wall so many times before you're just cut bait. That's how I do it. Yeah. Michael? Agreed. Yeah. Anybody back in? Say I could. Can you hear me now? Okay. Nice. Um, didn't hear your pro question, but I heard what Evan said. <laughs> Um, I think it's interesting doing so much consulting, how many of the problems that we run into aren't even specifically technology or security problems, but business problems. And when there's a lack of communication, there's a lack of upward communication or um, empowerment on IT directors, on security leaders to actually get the resources, know how to communicate biz with business leaders to essentially make their case for why it does matter to the business leaders. Um, but that's a significant gap in an area that just needs more training, more awareness, both from the leaders down, but also the IT leaders up. So. Oh, I can't tell you how many times working in the IR case that the client or their legal team go, can you leave that out of the report? No. I don't care what you end up submitting, but we can't you know, risk the integrity of our name and, and what's in the report we're it's what we found our number, our number one our number one core value number one tell is the, what tell the truth. we tell the tell truth, the truth. Yep. and the thing that people don't realize about the truth is there's lies of commission and there's lies of omission a lie of commission it's easy to avoid that one i just don't say something that's not true but then there's the lies of omission those are the things that you should know but i didn't tell you and so both are lies so, it, you know, it, it, so if you're not going to re, if you're not going to hire me again, if you're not going to work with me again, because I told you the truth, that's on you. Yep. I'll sleep well tonight. And I know that as you're growing a business, when you're first starting, you, because uh, some of, there's some small business people here who are just starting their businesses where you can't afford to say no, right? You got bills to pay. And, you know, I kind of can't fault you for that. It's nice to be in a position now where you can be choosy about your customers. But there was a day when I was losing my house with FR Secure because uh, we didn't know how to sell. And there was a company that called that asked if, if I would do an incident response for them. And I started asking questions about this company and found out that they're in the adult entertainment field. And I'm like, okay, I knew the answer. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy of faith, so I called my pastor, and I'm like, what should I do? And he's like, you already know the answer. And I'm like, but this is going to save my damn house. And, uh, you know, talk about ethics, I decided not to take that job. Still ended up losing the house. Now, that, that's a, you have to figure out what your own boundaries are going to be. But then stick to it. Uh, so in terms of consulting people... If you can sleep well at night not telling people the truth, well, then that's, that's on you. If I find out about it, I'll tell your customer the truth. I have one more ethical question to ask of you guys. How has the ethical landscape changed based on new technology that's out there? I got to know Mike. What? One more time. Changed all my ethics. How has ethical, the ethical landscape changed because of new technology? I, it... it, it I don't know. Sometimes it feels like we are leaning towards more ethics in the industry. 
but then other times it feels like we lean that we're polar opposite. We don't get in the middle. Um, and like new technology, the terms around AI, the terms around, you know, uh, we joke about like uh, zero trust. Zero trust has been around for 20 years, but they became a buzzword for the industry to use. And it's the same thing. Forrester. With Forrester. 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 Yeah. They yep. invented that. They invented it. So it, it's the same kind of thing with, you know, the how, how vendors, how people are coming out with the different, the, the newest tech and the newest thing because they're jumping on that bandwagon and they're pushing it through. Um, and then utilizing the tools. Uh, to, you know, we heard some talks earlier, uh, utilizing the tools to develop code with AI. And I think there's, <laughs> you to tell me when you're gonna post. <laughs> so, you know, using a lot of those different, um, that's where a lot of that ethics stuff comes in, is, you know, coming back to being honest, like we were talking about. You know, in the last question, is just having the truth. Uh, you know, our core value is honesty as well and making sure that we bring in that honesty in the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if we're not doing something, we'll be happy to tell you we're not. So. Megan or Brian? I think, you know, with AI, the deep fakes, you know, impersonation and of people's voices, it's, it would be easy to be unethical if, if you wanted. So, you know, it is going to be interesting to see if there's regulatory stuff that comes out because of that to protect. So, you know, it's going to be when some big celebrity or politician gets, has something negative happen with that, you're going to see them introduce regula regulations to try and rein that in. Yeah, I don't feel like the ethical questions have probably changed. They just look different. They can be... Yeah discovered more easily in some mm -hmm. cases, but also hidden more easily in some cases, like with the deep fakes, but also the analysis, the visibility of social media, a lot of public, the public calling individuals out for unethical behavior, but there's ways to bypass it. So I think it just mostly looks different. Okay. We're gonna just switch gears a little bit because you've all been involved in some incident response activities over the course of your career. And would like to hear from each one of you, what is like the most unusual incident that you have worked in your career to date that you can share without incriminating anybody, that you can share? I, I think, you know, I, I was thinking about this. There's not, for me, it's not like an unusual incident. It's an unusual response to the incident. It's the, the one, the most unusual one, you know, active breach, um, fully compromised, the team reaching out to them to try to engage them to figure out, okay, let's let's start, you know, threat hunting, let's get an IR plane in. I was like, oh, I, I'm busy. I got, I got, I got this going on. I, I have this activity. I got this, I got that. I was like, do I really need to do this? Because, you know, I don't have time right now. And in having the, and so I had to call them and, and it was a friend of mine through a thing. So I had to call and reprimand my friend to say, you need to prioritize this because you're losing all your financial data right now. You're in a full compromise. So it was, it's more of like, the, and then there's others along that, but it's more of, you know, for us, it's more of kind of how that individuals respond to that incident and the prioritization of, you know, that this is going on. So. I can think of two really, and it was interesting, one of them, is uh, we're taking over to Stress Bank. And when you do that, you go in Saturday after they close and do your full investigation because Monday morning, the new signage is coming up. And we couldn't figure out one particular thing. And so they called the lady that was responsible and she's like, oh, I'll come in, I'll come in, I'll show you. And we're like, no, no, we just, turns out she'd been embezzling for like 12 years, over a million dollars. And that's what separation of duties, rotation, those types of things, that's why it's so important. Uh, another time, highly regulated industry, and one of the, we started seeing uh, traffic to Pirate Bay. And we're like, well, that's not good. One of the technicians on the help desk had hooked up a computer to his phone, uh, uh, Cisco phone, VoIP phone, and was streaming and grabbing, you know, pirating. Not, not great, so that was an interesting investigation. And then. He was fired for cause and he, 
fought it because unemployment was denied. So I had to testify in front of the unemployment board what I found. And man, I was so glad I had documented everything because you never know when you're going to get called to testify. And if you can't show it, that's, that's and, a bad day for you. they don't call you to testify the next day. No. It's oh, always no, like it two was, or three years later. This, this case, it was about three weeks because ah. he, when he went to go apply for it, the employer fought it and said, no, he was fired for cause. He doesn't, he doesn't qualify. And so he challenged it. But even three weeks, I mean, I barely remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> It's been a lot, man, over the years. I'm trying to think which one. I can remember the first one. It was a uh, Romanian who had attacked my server that, I, you know, because it was back then you didn't, you didn't separate information security and networking. So I was a network guy. And so I was responsible for the infrastructure. And it was the first ever I'd ever even heard of a SQL injection attack, you know. But back then, so he defaced my website our website. It was Jask Software. We made Paint Shop Pro. Remember back in the day? And so, uh, and he, but then he gave me instructions. He emailed me instructions on how to fix it. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. Thanks, man. But you know, you have the target breach. That was, uh, it was crazy, you know, certainly unusual. And, I, and we'll never have another breach like that one. At that time, the way it all went down, that was really crazy. I think, um, Man, there's, there's a lot of them. It's, it's probably the target breach. Oh, well, okay. This is a hospital that um, they, I'm not on call, right? So I'm like sleeping on my Friday night. And I get up in the morning and my phone is just lit up with messages and phone calls. And so I start playing them and it's this big health system hospital. They've been calling me all night because they had a ransomware attack and so I you know call him back and he's and he's like why did it take you so long to call me back I'm like get your get a copy of your incident response plan and let's go through it where in there does it say to call me <laughs> you know I'm not your incident response plan and so but I did go there and when I went there they had you had CISA there you had the FBI there you had the local sheriff there you had two incident response teams you had an insurance whatever and I come walking in I'm like what the hell is going on and it's just like chaos and so I start going around the room like what are you doing here I don't know I'm like well you can leave what are you doing here well I, they called us okay but you don't know what you're doing here no okay you can leave so we narrowed it down to like four people and then what made that one really unusual is it ended up being another health system because you know we were I'm trying to figure out containment so they've, they've been eight hours or so into this already and still hadn't even considered containment with all these people. You know, you thought somebody would have brought that up. So I'm like, well, what, are, what other connections do you have? What other site-to-site -site VPNs do you have? Where might this go? And then we find out that it, it actually, they have a site-to-site -site VPN with one of FR Secure's customers. So then I get Oscar to get the team, do some threat hunting on the other side of this while we work on this. And then while they're working on that one, Brian Krebs calls. Brian, you guys know who Brian Krebs yep. is. I worked with Brian Krebs way back when, when I did a thing called the Breach Blog. I don't like Brian very much anymore. But anyway, that's a whole thing. But Brian had called this other hospital system, called the CEO, and started asking questions. So then Oscar's team calls me like, what's going on? I'm like, all right. So I got on the phone with, I get Brian, me, and the team. And it turns out that Am I, I, I can out people here, right? Alex Holden? I don't know if you guys know who Alex Holden is. Hold security out in Wisconsin. He's got a reputation with me. But anyway, he had been on a Russian f forum, and there was uh, talk about heck, or ransoming 438 hospitals in the United States simultaneously. And I'm like, and so when he's telling me this, I'm like, and I didn't know it was Alex Holden yet. I'm like, where did you get this information, Brian? And why the hell would you call the damn CEO of this company? This is stupid. But he's one of those guys anyway. Well, anyway, you, you go down all these rabbit holes. I'm on the phone with CISA. I'm trying to like figure out, because if this is actually true, holy crap, we got a big problem on our hands. Well, it turns out it was all bullshit. But it was still fun to like, 
And it was also fun to play through, like, if this had actually been legit, we would have been really screwed. And nothing's really changed since then. Do you remember that? <laughs> Do you remember that one when, when I had that incident response at that one hospital and then we were, and Brian Krebs called? Yeah, that was. What? Imminent attack, 438 Imminent. hospitals at the same time. All the hospitals. What about Brian that? Krebs is a jerk off. Is what about that here? law firm, Evan? Do you remember this one? What? The, the law firm that the techs, they were clearly compromised and the techs kept uninstalling our tools because their computers were slow. <laughs> and like two months, and we kept going, we're seeing traffic from here. What, what machine is that? What IP? I don't, what do you, what? They didn't even know. It was that. Yeah. There's so Oscar many, remembers that one too. That there was so many hot awesome, mess. so many awesome stories. And it really, it's nothing special about me or anything because we posture a lot, right? I mentioned that before. It's just, you live long enough. Because I remember when I got called to be on that target breach, it was the special litigation committee. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? I'm like pinching myself, like, really? Me? Here? Now? Sometimes things just happen. But really good stories. Yep. And turn a little bit more serious because, uh, or, I'm sorry, Megan, did you have a comment you wanted to come? I, w I was just going to add, like, I don't have any personal stories, but this is why I like working with uh, preparedness because I hear all of these stories and hear the mix of just teams not being prepared, whether it's that they're not taking the issue seriously enough and they go about normal business and think it's no big deal, or they over, you know, panic and there's chaos and nobody knows who's in charge of the issue. And so that's why it's really important to at least create, start that conversation, know who should be involved, what is your critical business operations. I know a lot of the time um, we put doing business impact analyses off and never do them, but they're so critical because how else does your IT team or your first responder know how uh, urgently to raise that flag and who to involve and how quickly to respond um, so that they can set the appropriate uh, things in motion for that quick response to avoid something more drastic from happening. With that too is like the, vi the victim shaming where yeah. as a user, when they click on something and they give up their credentials and then they're like, they're freaked out because somebody's going to yell at them and they don't talk about it and they go back and they try to hide it. But if they, and then it gets found by the SOC or the team later, but if they would have said something ahead of time and we get out of this victim shaming of people that click on links and click on stuff, because, you know, we're all, we're human, we're users, and I click on everything. So send me stuff if you want. Um, it's, 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 so, but we, if we can get out of that, that helps some of that too. So. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes to like the culture of your organization yeah. and yeah. kind of like the previous speaker or one of the previous speakers was saying, it's like, making it part of your culture, everyone working together so that there isn't that shame, whether it's your IT director, your security operations, like there's always gonna be gaps and the attackers are always gonna be coming for it, for you. Something's gonna get through some time to some degree, collaborating to work together as an organization and solve those problems rather than, yeah, blaming. It's not if, it's what. So I'm just gonna take a little more serious and to turn something here, because it is, <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunately. <laughs> But um, because it is a real issue that I think every position in cybersecurity faces, it's not just CISOs, it's not just your engineers or your threat hunters, but that is the, the state of mental health for cybersecurity because there is a lot of pressure, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear. How have you seen this play out in, in, in just in your experience over the course of all the years that you've been dying in cybersecurity? Like the highs, lows, what have you seen people do to help combat that? Uh, the mental health piece of it. There was an article, article, what, five years ago about CISOs were like the biggest alcoholics out there for the longest time because that's the only way they could really cope and sleep kind of thing. <laughs> but I think it's not just CISOs. I think it's anybody that feels the stress of trying to find and keep that organization secure. So what have you guys seen? How have you guys been able to coach people through this or coach your teams through that? Brian? So or Brad, I'm sorry. No. Told you I'm bad at names. <laughs> Interesting. We, uh, Oscar and I had Mike on a m couple months ago. June, 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 yeah, yeah. In June. And we, we discussed this. And it, it really is. It's finding that work-life balance, finding those things 
that relieve the stress? What do you like doing? Get some, get a hobby. Just unplug for a little bit, and it really does help reset. Mm-hmm. Brad, Brad likes uh, Star Wars metal. Yeah. So uh, model you kits. The model kits. I, I like Legos. Him. I, I have a castle. Yep. Oh, nice. Like 18 inches tall, two feet by two feet. Yeah. I, so I'm sorry. We, so have yeah. hobbies. Yeah. Yes, hobbies. The other thing too is I think so mental health is really important to me. And because I, I, you know, and I was talking about it earlier, I get this voice in my head that starts telling me different stories and where are all these different little things going on. I'll be driving home and that person looked at me and I'm like, oh my, I'm a bad person. I cut them off. I did something wrong. And it's, and it's that same kind of thing within work and that are we doing enough? Are we protecting? Are we communicating enough? You know, that friend that I mentioned that didn't really care about the breach, the active breach that was going on. Like, why didn't I do enough for that? Or, you know, taking on that anxiety and, and having people that I trust and friends, you know, people that are here, you know, uh, to be able to reach out to and talk to about that stuff. That's really the big thing is that we're not alone. We're, we all have to go, we go through these different things. We, I go through imposter syndrome some days more than others. It's, it's a cycle. Um, and then what I usually do is I, I call somebody or I talk to, or I text a friend or I don't text a friend when he yells at me when I see him because I didn't reply to him in, in a timely fashion. But having that connection, having that group of people and knowing that we're not alone is really important for that. What's your shirt? Yeah. Truth and Cyber. Truth and Cyber. And then Mental Health Hackers is another great yep. organization for support, looking for support yep. in this industry that from people that get it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And for me, it's been like, number one is faith. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the decisions I make are kind of like uh, unconventional. And so I'm like, the hell did I just do? Uh, so one is faith. Two is uh, honesty. You know, spending a lot of time with myself, being inward, looking like, that's when I realized like, yeah, I have ADHD, but am I going to eat? And then you figure out like how it works and you figure out like it's a superpower when it's managed, when it's not managed, it's a curse, you know? And then the support yeah. thing is like super important. Uh, yeah. So faith, I think just truth and support, you know, seem to get, get me through. Megan? Yeah, just I think all of those things, it's like really important to take time for yourself and know what's meaningful on how you do that and being intentional about it. Um, sometimes I know, like, especially for any leader, but just for everyone going through lives, it sometimes it feels like, how can I add one more thing? H- how can just taking care of myself add one more thing? I'm just going to be busier, but it doesn't actually work like that even though because because you're taking time aside for yourself to make sure that you are individually taken care of which gives you energy back even though it takes time and it's one more thing out of your schedule it's so worth doing Um, I was sharing just with um, a a gal that I kind of work with and collaborate with lately it's like it used to be when somebody asked me like hey how are you personally doing right now I would just start crying because I wasn't taking good care of myself And now that I've added several things to my calendar to be busier, I feel better because those are things that are just for me, that get me away from all of my responsibilities where I'm just giving back to myself and it makes a huge difference. So I'm gonna ask you an add-on question for each one of you real quick. So y'all talked about the resources that you use and I know that probably everybody out there is like, but how do you actually do it? How do you actually give your employees that time to take care of themselves? Like how, what are your best tips that you tell your employees to make sure that they take care of themselves? Well, I mean, it goes to the truth thing. Being, tr- telling the truth is being true to yourself. Like who are you and be you. Don't come here and try to be somebody that you're not. Yeah. You know, if, if you talk this way, you talk this way. If you look this way, you look this way. Because this industry has got places for everybody, no matter how messed up you are because chances are you're probably not as messed up as I am anyway so it's just this truth understanding that this is relational mm-hmm. yep. this is about relationships this is about you know uh, 
and then just supporting people, you know, being there for them. To say, lead by example, or right? yeah. be, be open and honest with your employees that, hey, I'm stepping away, I need a break. Yeah. And letting them know it is okay to, to say that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think we do a good job of trying to offer flexibility, but then, like, if you had flexibility where people are penalized for taking that time off or shamed or uh, just don't feel like they can be open and honest about what they need to be human and okay, it makes a big difference. So I think, yeah, exactly that, like, being open about your own vulnerabilities, you know, within reason. You don't have to share every detail about your personal life, but... Being open and being like, yeah, sometimes I need that break and I'm glad you're getting that break. Reaffirming that they need to be taking care of themselves and honoring it and being respectful of it. Yeah, and openly discuss those stigma things or what people call our stigmas. The more you talk about them, the less stigma they are. When you talk about you know, mental health, depression, ADHD, suicide, work-life balance, the more you talk about it, the less awkward it feels. We talk... I mean, we have one-on-ones every week, and we talk about it all the time. And we focus more on how are you doing? I know, already know you know how to do the damn work. <laughs> how are you doing? And when you talk about work-life balance, like, my balance ain't the same as your balance. And that mine doesn't make mine any better or worse than yours. They're different. We're individuals. Like, I, I might work 80 hours this week. Next week, I might work 10. I don't know. And whereas like, and so if you measured everybody by, well, work-life balance at FR Secure is, you bill 40 hours a week, it's never going to work. Well, and let's be honest, a happy, mentally healthy employee is going to be more productive, right? So Stick give them a half a day yeah. off and keep them right? in a good spot. Feel yeah. more uh, apt to Love. contribute to That's the team, collaborate with the team, support other team members. Like it just keeps giving and giving yeah. to everyone. I, I, I agree. I mean, we're, we're really big proponents of that as well and, and, and talk about that a lot around how to create the space for us as individuals to get that mental health aspect. And then, and you're right, I, I always look at it as shadow casting. The, the shadow that I cast as a leader in the organization, it, I need to ensure that I, you know, talk about my fears, you know, my vulnerabilities with, within reason too, but within that space so that it gives the opportunity to have that connection with the team so they can feel safe in that, that we can sit down and talk through that stuff together. So I was talking, I was talking with uh, one of these leader guys last yesterday or the day before, and we were talking about mental health because we, it's a regular topic for us. And we were, I think we were at lunch or something. And I thought of Robbie. Now, some of you guys may not know who Robbie is. But Robbie was a guy who had been at FR Secure, a junior guy, hadn't been there very long, who was a penetration tester, and he took his own life. And I never forget exactly where I was at that time when I got that phone call from Peter Vinji. I was at dinner and, 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 uh, with my wife and my kids. And I stepped outside and I was like, oh, my, you know. And I, you go through these, you, when you process that stuff, you're like, what could I have done? Could I have done this? Could I have done that? And so I made a promise, not just to myself, but to Robbie, that that shit's not going to happen again because I didn't say something, because I was afraid to say something. So you also don't want to, like, overdo it. Like, every time, like, how you doing, Mike? No, I mean, really. (laughs) Seriously, man. I noticed you look at me a little different. Are you sure you're not depressed? I think you're depressed. That ain't the right way to do it, but... You know, I will say Evan I could do it with him. Telling the truth on that because I, when I was I was having a rough time, I've talked about it on the podcast, and he did. He sat me down and goes, "What the f- is going on with you? Are you okay?" And it really was the wake up call to go, "No, you're right," because you don't see it you're, you're in yourself. No. Well, what it helps to have those the people. Yeah. got here. You and I sat together and we talked about life stuff. Yep. You know, what I mean, because I'd much much rather talk about that. Especially when you don't know if, like, maybe you don't have anybody else in the world to talk to about that. You know, and if you happen to be that person, it's like, I'm too busy. You know, there's that thing that Simon Sinek put out recently about, do you have eight minutes? And so talking amongst my friends and and people as well about, you know what, if if you need to get that out in conversation, just text me. I need eight minutes. 
Because I can take eight minutes, I can take five minutes, I can take whatever it is just to be there for you. So to have that piece of it. And then as I see him there, Jordan, who just recently posted on LinkedIn, that <laughs> mental health aspect, we all go through it. You know, it's, we're, it's all of us, different layers, so. All right, well, I want to thank you guys. I know that was a very deep subject, but it is something that is very real in our industry, not in other industries too. It seems to be more prevalent for cybersecurity because we're always on because the bad actors never stop. And we have an ethical or almost a moral obligation to protect our organizations, and we take it very close and very personal. So I want to thank all you speakers for up here today. I really do appreciate your time, your candor, your vulnerability. Uh, appreciate that. That does conclude our speaker program for today, but please don't let the networking stop. There is more fun to be had up there.